Hello there guys, this is Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space and today I'm going to be reviewing Wise Blood and this is going to be a bit of a non-traditional review, kind of in the tradition of my 100 years of solitude review where I'm going to go through all of my notes with you guys. I have not written out a review ahead of time but I did keep track of my thoughts in the margins and on my tabs and I have a few thoughts written down as well. That I just noted down. I listened to a great lecture by a, a professor at Yale and they uploaded it to the Yale Courses YouTube. So I listened to that. I've been talking with friends about it. I'm really excited to finally put out a review of this. So um, this is my second time reading Wise Blood and I listened to it and physically read quite a lot of it. Um, but some of my physical reading was skimming because I had already listened to it and I remembered exactly what happened. And uh, for full disclosure, I titled my section <laughs> of notes in my iPad as I knew I would hate Wise Blood because I just thought going in that I was definitely going to hate this book. Also, full disclosure, the first time I read this, I've never told anyone this. I really didn't like it. I really hated it. I think Victoria might be the Victoria. I've told Victoria that. Um, and she was like, really? I didn't know that. I was like, yeah, that's because I never said it. <laughs> um, I had so much trouble reading this. I, I usually, when I was talking about it, would just say it's the most intense book I've ever read, which is true. And it's still true. However, listening to it, this is something that my co-hosts of Flannery January have been talking about in our Voxer group chat, which is that the humor of this book, the, especially the Southern humor, as someone who's always lived in California, um, I don't think I really got the humor at all the first time I read this. I was probably like 20 or something. And I just, I remember having to take a break halfway through because it was so intense. And I had read her short stories before, so I knew that she was intense, but this was a whole nother level of intensity. I didn't really find it funny, but I remember when Una and Leslie read this last year and did a live stream with crypto as well. Um, Leslie said it was so funny to her and that I think that was the first time I remember anyone really referring to it with humor and I was like, okay, I really do need to reread that then. Um, so I, I'm very pleased to say that on second read, I loved this uh, as an Enneagram 9 with a very empathetic heart. I, I still really felt for some of the characters. Um, I felt bad. Sorry, I have like a receipt just like blowing around over here. I'm just gonna put that in here. Um, <laughs> um, I don't want it to like be bothering you with the noise. So anyways, this is not a, a book that's like cozy. Like nothing about her characters are you know, happy, sympathetic, commendable, or worthy of imitation. If you're just looking for Christian fiction, this will not be probably what you're looking for. Christian fiction is usually meant to be showing times, it's meant to, um, I guess, show... Usually you'll find people that you like in Christian fiction and uh, can relate to and sympathize with and your empathetic heart. There's a lot of, I think, Enneagram 9 readers among Christian fiction readers <laughs> because we, we like cozy. We like reading sympathetic people. We like having a character to like. Uh, Flannery Connor was not concerned with any of those things. She was not, encourage, she was not encouraging people. That was not her purpose. Um, she lived with a lot of pain and darkness uh, as somebody who died at the age of 39 of lupus and also being Catholic in the south in when so she was born in 1925 and died in 1964 in georgia and so she was not one among many catholics she was one catholic among many protestants so that really informs her work as well i i'm aware of that but i don't really exactly know how very well you'll have to probably ask catholics <laughs> to understand that but i think um she felt that isolation and it comes through in her works. It's not a happy book. So you have to be prepared for that going in. And I was this time because I knew exactly what happened in the book. So I remembered parts of it so vividly, even though it was, you know, almost a decade ago that I read it. And that, that is really something. So there's a quote on here. This is a copy that Noah sent me. Thank you. 
my one of my co-hosts for this. Um, it says, no other major American writer of our century has constructed a fictional world so energetically and forthrightly charged by religious investigation. And that was a New Yorker review. I think that's definitely true. It does have that sense of religious investigation about it. So you, if you think, if you hear that Flannery O'Connor is a religious writer and you think, oh, that's probably not for me, don't judge it too quickly. <laughs> you don't even know what you're getting into. Um, so the reason why Flannery O'Connor's stories are so uh, intense is because she was very, and you see this in her essays, she talks about this a lot. Um, understanding her through her nonfiction, by the way, was the way that I understood her fiction. I didn't understand her fiction until I had read her nonfiction. She is shouting at people who do not listen to a religious voice. That is why her books are so violent and graphic and intense is because she's listening she's shouting so that people can hear her who wouldn't normally hear a religious writer or gravitate towards a religious writer um, people discuss this book in colleges like the yale courses um, because it is so unexpected i think and there is a lot of like symbolism and interesting things to dig into with her books and you will understand it better the more times you read it which is definitely what happened for me however she was trying to get her point across it was a simple point in a lot of ways and it's not going to be a big surprise probably going in um her, her point will probably not be a surprise the way she gets it across will be okay so let's kind of jump into this um we're going to go through my notes and react to them because that's what I have time for. And hopefully it'll be fun. So, okay, the first thing I noted was a quote. Um, there was already a deep black wordless conviction in him that the way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. So this was uh, Hazel in the very beginning when we're learning about his um, youth as he's growing up. Um, he was a a devoted Christian, I guess you would say growing up, but, um, you know, not like a happy childhood, even though he lived, I think he said his grandpa was a preacher or something. Um, but anyways, it was really, he knew early on and he knew throughout this book that there is a Jesus. Jesus exists. He knows that's the truth. He's trying to forget it. He's trying to believe that it's not important and that it's a lie. The light is bug bugging me, so I'm just going to like turn over a little bit. So you see this in his um, character all throughout the book. It's a very important part of Hazel's character. He cannot get a rid, he cannot get rid of the guy swinging from tree to tree in his mind or something like that. Uh, not exactly Tarzan, but uh, there's a quote like that somewhere in there. And that, that person that he cannot forget and get away from is Jesus. So he's trying to, but he sure can't. So maybe, um, should I start with like a little bit of a description so that if you haven't read the book yet, you will know when to stop. So, um, this book is following a man called Hazel Motes, who preaches the church of Christ without Christ, except he calls it something different. That's just the name that sticks out to me because it's catchier. Basically, he's trying to preach a world actually his his preaching changes throughout the book but he's basically trying to make himself feel better about how convicted he feels um to be a christian and how convicted he feels that fa that christ is real and um he spends his this entire book preaching against that idea and trying to get away from it and so you kind of find out what happens and if you've had any experience with flannery o'connor you can kind of guess some of what's going to happen to Hazel. Um, it's very, it's violent, we'll say. So um, that's really all I can say without spoiling it if you're concerned about spoilers. This is the kind of book where spoilers might actually help you get through the book. It definitely, I think, would have for me if I had uh, kind of read the ending first almost. I don't think that's a bad thing to do with classics. Some people would say different, but that's just my opinion. So I'm going to go on now. If you don't want spoilers, maybe just come back to this video after you have finished the book. It's very short. Um, again, it's I think it's pretty accessible on audiobook. You just have to keep track of which character is being talked about. Um, and there are some things that you will probably miss if you're simply listening to the audiobook and you've never read it before. There's some, like 
some things that the plot is like, what? I, I did not understand it even physically reading it, some, par some parts of the plot and how they were related. But anyways, okay, we're going to move on. Next quote. He took a long time to believe them because he wanted to believe them. So we see this is a quote from when Hazel was in the military. There are people in the military who are atheists and he is trying to believe what they believe, but he's a very methodical thinker and he has, it's so ingrained in his whole, every cell of his body that Christ is real, that it really takes him some time to believe that what they're saying could be true, even though he wants to. He wants to lose the moral responsibility. I think filming out here was a bad choice. I'm sorry about the lighting. It is what it is. Um, so we get a really good picture of Hazel's character as well as another character named Enoch. Really, a lot of the people in here, we get a good character and, and, and ha we get a good sense of their character and we see how they are formed. A lot of them are formed by abuse. There's uh, several characters in here who are neglected as young people or even abused and um, lots of stories of abuse. That's something that the Yale lecture, lecturer was talking about and that's definitely true. So you have to be ready for that as well, by the way. There is abuse happening constantly throughout this book. Um, there is <laughs> sexual predation on a minor, like there's just so many, there's so many problems, there's so many intense things in this book. I'm just saying it's, it's a very cancelable book. It's a very cancelable, cancelable book. And I think it has been cancelled because, um, there's been talk about Flannery O'Connor being a racist, but, uh, that's, that's really a topic for a different time. Yeah, and I honestly think she she was being an anti-racist in every sense that she knew how. So, anyways, um, so you, you just have to put it kind of in the context of her time and place. So, anyways, um, she reached out and gripped Hayes' arms just above the elbow. You hunting something? She drove. <laughs> so this is when Hazel first meets the first woman that he has ever he ever sleeps with his landlady he finds out about her place in a bathroom uh, her phone number is scrawled on a bathroom wall and he decides that's where he's gonna go and live so he says throughout this book you know that he doesn't have a place to go and so he like buys a car basically so he can live in it and um he's always kind of looking for belonging um and we have several characters who are also loneliness, so they're looking for belonging in relationships. Hazel is looking for belonging in a location. And um, so, yeah, and we'll get into that. I, I think um, I, we might as well get into it now. So he buys this really crappy car, which we will describe later with some quotes. And um, his car is his chosen place to live. He's like, this is where I'm going to live and run my life and this car is like so good there's nothing wrong with this car at all it's just gonna keep going forever it's gonna keep running and it's the crappiest car you can imagine we will get some quotes about it um and i think that that's a symbol for the life that hazel has chosen he is choosing this life he chose this car this crappiest car of all cars and there are other people's cars as well that are mentioned as kind of like their homes or their locations and that I think that's what the car is symbolizing. That's where Hazel has chosen to put his belonging, belonging, and it's it's crap. It's not a good place to live. <laughs> so, um, and that is what humans choose, right? We do tend to choose the worst things for ourselves because a lot of times our desires are unhealthy desires, and we don't necessarily want to admit that admit that to ourselves. But there are so many unhealthy things that we are attracted to as humans, and um, Hazel's life is just full of symbols of that. So, um, this, when his landlady is drawing, you hunting something, I don't think I laughed when I first read that, but when I listened to the audiobook narrator draw that, draw that with the southern draw, I think that made all the difference. Listening to this book was so hilarious, so funny with the southern draw, because that's not something I've experienced a lot. And... It's all throughout this book. If this book is read in a, like a, I guess you would call it a California accent, because that's, I guess you would call it that. I don't know. 
Um, to me, obviously, it sounds accentless, but I'm sure to everybody else, they're like, oh, yeah, that's a California laid back, you know, kind of accent. Um, but anyways, if it's read in my accent, it doesn't hit really at all. But if it's read in a southern accent, all the jokes hit. <laughs> and this is one of them. It's so cringy. That character, what is her name again? Mrs. Watts? Oh, she's so cringy. Uh, okay, next quote. Hayes' shadow was now behind him, and now before him, and now and then broken up by other people's shadows. But when it was by itself, stretching behind him, it was a thin, nervous shadow walking backwards. So, okay, what I... This quote is, okay, this is like the beginning of chapter three. And I highlighted nervous here because it's not very often that we really get uh, very explicit clues to Hazel's state. Flannery O'Connor, sorry about the noise. I can't cut it out because I'm not editing this. <laughs> That's my new thing, I'm not editing. Um, oh my gosh, it's not even here yet. It's still coming. I'm sorry in advance. Okay. Um, frequently, we don't know what Hazel is thinking and feeling. Oh my gosh, it's so loud. I can see it on my Audacity audio. <laughs> it's going loud. Ah, it's so loud. Okay, it's finally gone. Mostly. Okay, anyways nervous this is like explicitly telling us how hazel is feeling and that's not very common in this book and this is a problem i have like with a lot of authors like dostoevsky we frequently aren't seeing inside the head of the characters we don't directly see what they're thinking and feeling and so i am constantly guessing i'm not really good at piecing together symbols and guesses and stuff like that um that's something that i really struggled with in school and i still struggle with even as an adult um it's strange because as an Enneagram 9, I do pride myself on my ability to see different sides, but I need to have it explained very clearly. So I always appreciate these kinds of clues. Hazel is like a nervous wreck throughout his life. He tries... When I first read it, he came off to me as very like angry and like closed off purposefully. Like he just didn't care about anybody. But I don't think that that's the case. And this is what the Hazel, this is what the Yale courses professor said. She actually said Hazel can't hear and can't see everybody around him who's making so much noise, so much that, you know, we as readers might pity some of these characters, disgusting as they are. <laughs> They're all so unlikable in so many ways, but sometimes I still feel humanity in them, and it's, it's upsetting to see them upset, like when Enoch just, like, sobs and cries, and there's, like, snot coming down his face. It's just like, oh, my heart, my Enneagram 9 heart. But, um... Yeah, Hazel, Hazel can't see or hear them because he can only see and hear one thing, and that's Jesus climbing around in his mind. And um, you see the name Hazel Motes. Uh, Hayes, so haze is like haze. You, can, you have trouble ha seeing through a haze, right? And then moat, like a moat in your eye. He can't see for the moat in his eye. Um, it's referring to that Bible verse. And... Um, so he, he is actually senseless for everything except Christ. And that's, I think, part of the theming in this book. Um, okay, moving on. I said, Jesus, show me the way to get out of here without killing this year woman and getting sent to the penitentiary. And darn if he didn't. <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't remember what this is. It might have just been funny to me. Um, okay, yeah, so this is, this is Enoch talking, and it's a joke related to Enoch. Um, he was sent to live with some kind of religious woman when he was a kid, and he, he's trying to, I kind of get the sense that not only is he not a seeker, like, he's definitely not a seeker, but he's trying to kind of win with Hazel, um, because Hazel is saying all these anti-Christian things, and so I think Enoch is trying to be like, yeah, like, I had to live with this Jesus freak lady for so long, it was terrible, and I ended up, and I just prayed that Jesus would help me not kill her, or I'd get sent to the penitentiary. 
And then, so instead he got up one morning at just daylight and I went into her room without my pants on and pulled the sheet off her and give her a heart attack. <laughs> heart at attacked. I can't read the accent, I'm sorry. So basically, that's how he got rid of the Jesus lady. They, She kicked him out after that, so. Uh. Okay. Jesus loves you, the blind man said in a flat, mocking voice. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Nothing matters but that Jesus don't exist, Hayes said, pulling his arm free. Okay, so this is Hayes talking to, is this um, Asa Hawks that he's talking to? Uh, I'm not sure. Hmm. Okay, we'll move on. You don't know nobody neither, Enoch said. You ain't got no woman nor nothing to do. I knew when I first seen you, you didn't have nobody or nothing but Jesus. So this is another thing that happens with Hazel. Frequently, people will try to get on his good side. They'll like be drawn to him in some way and they'll try to get on his good side. And then when he just flat out ignores them, they will suddenly start saying, I knew you were a Jesus freak. I knew you were a preacher. I knew you didn't have anything but Jesus. So people can't help seeing this about Hazel. And every single time he's like, I don't need Jesus. I am clean on my own. You know, he's like trying to deny it, convincing nobody. He, he is convincing nobody. <laughs> You act like you think you got wiser blood than anybody else, he said, but you ain't. I'm the one that has it, not you, me. So this is um, Enoch saying that his wise blood tells him what to do. This is a thing that I still don't quite get. Is this like an expression in the South saying that you are you have wise blood or something? I don't know. I know like in Korea, um, there's this belief that blood type really affects your personality. I, I'm not really sure. So... If you know what the wise blood in the, even in the title is, let me know. But anyway, we Enoch basically consults himself and himself alone about what to do and what to believe. And this light is terrible. Okay, awesome. Okay, which Hazel kind of tries to do, but he doesn't pull it off the way Enoch does. <laughs> his throat got drier and his heart began to grip him like a little ape clutching at the bars of his cage. Okay, this is funny because obviously apes come into this book later. That must be why I highlighted it. So this is Hazel. I think I highlighted it because apes come into this later. Or rather gorilla, a gorilla comes into it later. <laughs> um, okay. She didn't hit him again, but she stood looking at him, shut-mouthed, and he forgot the guilt of the tent for the nameless, unplaced guilt that was in him. So this is when Hazel is a child, and he goes to a fair with his father, and he sees a naked woman in one of the fair tents that his father has gone into, and he feels guilty about that, and he feels unclean about that, and that is his mom talking to him about that. So, um, he thought that ought to satisfy him. <laughs> It took me a while to understand in this sentence, the him is God. And so what God, what is supposedly satisfying God is that Hazel is putting rocks in his shoes, lacing them up, and then going and walking for a mile. And he's trying to appease God's anger through this. So guilt is something that he's always had ever since he was a child. Okay, so I underlined, he was going to buy a car. So I, and I wrote a note, he's going for the American dream, but it's cheap and terrible what he gets. He's just like Enoch, just as lost and confused and nervous and upset. They both find something they want to pursue. So, oh, and he could tell from the outside of the lot if it would have a $50 car in it. Okay. So this is the beginning of chapter um, four. So three was a long chapter, wasn't it? Or at least I had a lot of quotes in it. And this is where Hazel is trying to go buy his terrible car. And he can tell from the outside of a lot if, if it will have a car that he can afford. Uh, so um, because he has so little money and he's trying to kind of go his own way, 
and with this car that's all he can afford and it's crap and same thing with Enoch he's trying to do his own thing to absolve his loneliness and he he just can't quite do it he really he can't do it so when he got up to it he saw that one door was tied on with a rope and that it had an oval window in the back this was the car he was going to buy <laughs> so when I first read this I was like why does he choose this car just because it's cheap? Did it never occur to him to get a job and save? No, of course it didn't. And also he's on some kind of disability pay, which you find out later from the military. So maybe he can't get a car, but in the end, he's also throwing away his money rather than, you know, any anything that he doesn't need for his landlady, he would just throw in the trash. <laughs> so I think um, it's interesting because he is so not conscious of money at all. Anybody who's really interested in money, he thinks is a phony, basically. And yet he's like buying into this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a car and you know, but it's, it's a tool for him. So yeah, a car with the door tied on with a rope. <laughs> so great. I don't have to run from anything because I don't believe in anything, Hazel says. Yeah, right, right. Okay. You just keep telling yourself that, honey. I am clean, Hayes said. This is the next chapter. I think it's chapter five. Yeah, maybe, or six. I am clean, Hayes says. Yeah, um, who are you trying to convince? In this case, he's trying to convince Enoch. Um, it, it's so funny because when Hazel is talking with people, they will go on on their own. It's always a miscommunication. They'll be going on on their own track, whatever it is. If it's, you know, Asa Hawk's daughter, Sabbath, she's trying to seduce him. If it's Enoch, he's like trying to, I don't know, just get his attention, show him things, be friends. And Hazel is always like, all, of, all probably most of his dialogue is that I am clean, that that's his dialogue all the time, no matter what people are talking about, that's what he's most concerned with. It was looking directly at Hazel Motes. I am clean, Hayes said to the eye. <laughs> so this is, is this a bird? I think there, he squinted close to the wire and saw that the piece of mop was an owl with one eye open. It was looking directly at Hazel Motes. So just an owl looking at him instantly provokes him into, I am clean, you know, stop looking at me. Oh, poor Hazel, he cannot escape this eye. Oh, I can't really pronounce this, but when Enoch is trying to take Hazel on a trip to the museum, he calls it a movsivum. <laughs> the strange word made him shiver. This was the first time he had ever said it aloud and it shows that that is what he was trying to pronounce <laughs> so great if i have a chance i want to take pictures of this and put it into the video but i just have a feeling i'm not going to have a chance so okay the next quote this is uh mm, chapter six okay Hayes had gone out to his car to think, and he had decided that he would seduce Hawk's child. So this was one of the very few times where we're seeing directly into his head. He wants to seduce Hawk's child. That's his plan. He felt, sh he felt that he should have a woman, not for the sake of the pleasure in her, but to prove that he didn't believe in sin since he practiced what, what was called it, sin. But he had had enough of her. <laughs> okay. He didn't want to go back to Mrs. Watts because when he was asleep, she had gotten up and cut the top of his hat out in an obscene shape. So now he's decided he is going to uh, seduce Asa Hawk's child Sabbath, which um, I know Tiffany was very concerned with how old is this child? Sabbath is uh, completely neglected, has nobody who loves her, and is really just... Hello again, guys. So my camera cut off. Sorry about that. Let's get back to it. Okay. Where were we? Um, okay. Yeah. So basically, he wants to get good at practicing sin without feeling guilty for it. So that's what he's doing. Um, he also wants to 
anger the preacher. I'm not entirely sure why he's decided he's going to antagonize this preacher, but I think that in Asa Hawks, he has been fooled into believing that Asa Hawks is the real, the real deal. That's really what Hazel wants is the real deal. Um, he talks so, so many times, He's you could quote him in this novel saying, you ain't true, you know, you ain't real, you are lying, that kind of thing to like false teachers and people like that. And um, it takes him a long time to realize that uh, Asa Hawks is a false preacher, <laughs> um, a con man, because he's blind, basically. He is, he cannot see these things. So uh, you make a lot of mistakes and errors when you are relying on your own sight for everything. Nobody with a good car needs to be justified, Hayes murmured. <laughs> That quote is just like so characteristic of Hazel. That is like, I posted that on my Instagram and everybody was like, what? <laughs> if, you, if you know, you know, right? Okay. He told the man that he wanted the horn made to blow and the leaks taken out of the gas tank, the starter made to work smoother and the windshield wipers tightened. So this is Hazel talking to a car repairman and he's trying to get the man to repair his irreparable car and the guy's like I can't do any of I can't do it I'm sorry it's impossible and Hazel's like what do you mean it's impossible this car is great there's nothing wrong with this car I just need you know the horn made to blow the leaks taken out of the gas tank and the starter made to work smoother and the windshield wipers tightened uh, there was a quote in here that I might have missed but he turns on the windshield wipers for the first time and Flannery call says it sounds like two idiots clapping in church. <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious. The book is just so saturated with religious references and images. You will not find them anywhere but in a Flannery novel. <laughs> he couldn't see how a preacher who had blinded himself for Jesus could have a bastard. <laughs> so this is when he's talking to Sabbath. I think she's climbed in the back of his car. And um, he's trying to figure out how Asa Hawks could really be a really devout G man for Jesus when he has a bastard child. He's like, that, that can't be. You must not understand. You must be misunderstanding something, Sabbath, about your own birth. You know, You're f you couldn't possibly be a bastard. <laughs> Meanwhile, again, he and Sabbath are talking at cross purposes because... She just wants to get his attention, and she keeps acting provocatively, like, Oh yeah, you know, I wrote to a newspaper person, somebody writing in the newspaper an advice column, and asked, since I'm a, you know, bastard and I won't get into heaven anyways because of that, can I just, like, sleep with somebody, <laughs> you know? And um, he is just paying her absolutely no attention, just like her father. He also paid her no attention. You couldn't be a bastard, Hayes said, getting very pale. You must be mixed up. Your daddy blinded himself. So this, the blinding himself, Asa Hawks blinding himself is why Hazel Motes is convinced that this guy is the real deal, right? You wouldn't blind yourself unless you're the real deal, which as we find out is what Hazel does to himself. He successfully blinds himself because he is the real deal, <laughs> which is weird to say of a murderer and uh it's, he's not really a sympathetic character at all, is he? Hazel's really not, not sympathetic. But in still at the end when he died and the cops didn't even notice, like, it still, like, hurt my heart, you know? It, all of these characters, you think you can't possibly care about them and then something bad happens to them. And then I'm like, oh, you poor thing. But that's probably just me. I think a lot of people probably don't care. The Yale professor said she didn't ever care. Like, she could not care for these characters other than, like, Enoch. <laughs> so, um, okay, yeah, I was just commenting here about how, like Dostoevsky, psychology is usually guessed from clues and rarely spelled out with the lengthy verbiage of an older classic. Older classics, you will often hear exactly what's inside somebody's head. That's one of the main differences between modern books and classic books, and, and it's part of why classic books are usually so long, whereas more modern classics are much slimmer. <laughs> um, there's a lot that's inferred, which I think is why I really struggled with them as a child and as a teenager. I just didn't understand the inferences at all. I was very much like a black and white, what's on the page is the story kind of a reader. 
The thing in his mind said that the truth didn't contradict itself and that the bastard couldn't be saved in the church of Christ in the church without Christ. So church church without Christ is what his church is called. So this is hilarious because you know again talking completely at cross purposes with Sabbath Hazel is so focused on like how the word bastard completely destroys his worldview about his own church because you can't have a bastard in the church without Christ because that wouldn't be something that exists, you know, because bastard implies that somebody did something wrong. And in his worldview that he's trying to create and convince everyone of, you can't do anything wrong. It's all very relative, which is also hilarious because he's going around preaching it. And there's a quote in here later that says, uh, you know, he went around trying to tell this guy what to believe. <laughs> and that, that is, if you're a relativist, that's what you're doing. You're telling people that they have to believe that it's relative and that no truth is actually truth. There wouldn't be any sense to the word bastard in the church of Christ without Christ, of, in the church without Christ. So yeah, and I, I, my comment was, they are speaking totally different languages, which is true. What's wrong in there? Hayes asked in an agitated voice. It's a good car, isn't it? <laughs> and for me, I, this was when Hayes was talking to somebody who was trying to fix his car after it stopped on like the roadside, I think. And what I'm hearing Hayes say in this sentence, rather than, it's a good car, ain't it, is... I'm doing fine, aren't I? I'm doing well, right? The meaning extends to himself because he made the bad decision to buy the car and he wants his own decisions to be the best. So badly. I told you, didn't I? This car will get me anywhere I want to go. It may stop here and there, but it won't stop permanent. <laughs> my way works just fine, doesn't it? Was my translation. Some things, the man says, will get folks somewheres. <laughs> When Hazel's like, this will get me wherever I want to go. <laughs> the, the man's like, yeah, okay. Um, and so there was this imagery of a blinding white cloud that had turned into a bird with long thin wings and just disappearing in the opposite direction. So Hayes missed a chance, I think, in this scene to uh, have a come to Jesus moment, we'll say. And um, that was something that the Yale professor went over quite a bit. So... Um, I didn't, I, again, symbolism isn't really my strength for the most part. I can get some really obvious ones, but anyways. Uh, so I commented, I still do not understand why Enoch is here. Because <laughs> we're getting whole chapters at this point about Enoch. And I was very confused the first time I read this, and for most of the second time I read this, as to why Enoch is even here. Um, there was a quote in Flannery Connor's letters where she's like, you know, Enoch just comes to her very, very, um, f she had no questions in her mind about Enoch. He just came to her very easily as a writer. Um, and so eventually I understood why Enoch was here. So we'll get to that eventually. This was a disappointment to him because he had hoped that the money would be for some new clothes for him. And here he saw it was going into a set of drapes. <laughs> and my comment was, you could just buy clothes, confused. This is when Enoch is listening to his wise blood and ends up buying things that he's disappointed that he's buying. And I'm just like, just buy what you want, dude. <laughs> then for about a week, his blood was in secret conference with himself every day, only stopping now and then to shout some order at him. So it's his blood that's giving the orders around here. That was my comment. I'm figuring Enoch out by this point. Look at me, Hazel Motes cried with a tear in his throat, and you look at a peaceful man. And my comment was, yeah, right. You are not peaceful, dude. He's out on the street preaching now, the church without Christ, on top of his car, and nobody is believing him or following him at all. Peaceful, because my blood has set me free rather than Christ's blood. Take counsel from your blood, wise blood. And come into the church without Christ, and maybe somebody will bring us a new Jesus, and we'll all be saved by the sight of him. This is where I finally understood Enoch, because Enoch hears him say this. And I realized Enoch, when he brings him the dragged up old specimen from the museum, is trying to bring him the new Jesus. I just laughed out loud. It's so great. So um, Enoch takes this as his mission from his wise blood. Um, but it's slightly tied in. Okay, yes, that that's ba so the the 
shriveled man that Enoch ends up bringing him is very symbolic of the kind of Jesus that Hazel is trying to find. His Jesus is really nothing special. <laughs> it's also nothing new. It's not a new Jesus. This is an old man who's been dead a million years, and he's just a dried up sack of dust, basically. Um, so old as dirt, symbolic of Hazel's God. What is next? Hazel couldn't understand why the preacher didn't welcome him and act like a preacher should when he sees that what he believes is a lost soul. So Hazel's still puzzling over the mystery of Asa Hawks. Um, and Hazel is curious about the man because he thinks this man is the real deal. Exactly. He abandoned the notion of seducing her and tried to protect himself. And I just have... Which is the Korean way of saying laughter. They have like a K sound. Um, so by this point, he is very aware that the little the little bastard child, you know, um, Sabbath is not innocent at all. And she's trying to seduce him, which is pretty disgusting because who even knows how old she is? She's trying to pass as 15, which means I'm thinking she's like maybe 12 or 13. So yuck, right? If Hayes had believed in praying, he would have prayed for a disciple, which is hilarious because Enoch would totally be his disciple if he would let if you would pay any attention to Enoch Enoch would totally do it the only way to the truth is through blasphemy so that's something he's preaching to everybody but he actually changes his mind about that later and I'm not entirely sure why that is if you guys understand that then let me know but it's something to do with you know if I am blaspheming something I can't say that it doesn't exist I can't say that my whole worldview rests in blasphemy um, if my worldview is that what I'm blaspheming doesn't exist. So he's realizing the circularity of his argument. This man is not true, he said. I never saw him before tonight. So he really can't get the intensity of his preoccupation with truth out of himself, uh, even as he's going around trying to convince everybody of a lie, he can't stop being preoccupied with the truth. <laughs> That's like the only thing that gives him any integrity at all. According to the Yale professor, Hazel is not just ignoring people. Oh, yeah, we already went over that, didn't we? In yourself right now is all the place you've got. So that he always feels very lonely. He feels like his chest is empty. There's various quotes of him saying, you know, his chest hurts and stuff like that. Um, so he's trying to find belonging and he's not really succeeding at it. Where in your time in your body has Jesus redeemed you? He cried, show me where because I don't see the place. If there was a place where Jesus had redeemed you, that would be the place for you to be. But which of you can find it? So, yeah, again, the preoccupation with place. I thought anybody would have seen what he was before that without having to strike no match. <laughs> Hazel cannot see that this is Sabbath talking to Hazel. She's like, I can't believe you didn't see it until you struck a match in my father's face that he w didn't actually blind himself. But he has that moat in his eye blocking his view. That innocent look don't hide a thing. He's just pure filthy right down to the guts like me. The only difference is I like being that way and he don't. And Hazel replies, I want to. So Sabbath want is attracted. She's attracted to sin because it's sin. And Hazel tries hard to be attracted to sin because he wants to be. He wants to be convinced that he is clean no matter how much he sins. But he can't do it. <laughs> that is his integ integrity. No gorilla in existence, whether in the jungles of Africa or California or in the New York City, in the finest apartment in the world, was happier at that moment than this one, whose God had finally rewarded it. So um, this is Enoch finding his gorilla suit. He just beat up the guy, Ganga, the gorilla. He just beat up Ganga and stole the suit from him. <laughs> and so he's very happy very briefly because he thinks that wearing the gorilla suit is going to give him the opportunity to connect with people because he has seen the gorilla going around and shaking hands with people who line up in long lines for the opportunity of shaking a hand with him. So the first people that he goes up to to try and shake their hand in his gorilla suit 
scream and run away because they're out in nature and it's just frightening to them. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I thought maybe it also symbolized Enoch's determined descent into from manhood into gorillahood because without God, man is just kind of an animal. But that could be reading too deeply into it. I think Flannery probably just thought it was funny. Yeah, and it's it's a sad moment, right? When he's standing in the gorilla suit and just like, he holds out his hand to shake hands with the people and they run away and he just drops his hand and sits and watches the sunset. <laughs> uh, amazing. Okay. You ain't true, Hayes said. What do you get up on top of a car and say you don't believe in what you do believe in for? So this is when Hayes is following the false prophet who um, has been working together with another false prophet that Hayes has already had a run-in with. Hayes rejected the first guy who was trying to use him as a false prophet. And he said, this guy ain't true. Um, and holy J... I don't remember, something like that. Holy J something. And so Hayes tracks down the false prophet and says, why are you saying something that you know is not true and trying to convince people of it? Because Hazel is doing the same thing. <laughs> and so two things I can't stand, Hayes said. A man that ain't true and one that mocks what is. You shouldn't ever have tampered with me if you didn't get want to get what you got. And Hazel runs over him with the car. <laughs> Just yikes. 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 And this man, even as he's dying, is, um, he is, uh, what do you call it? Confessing to Hazel like he's a priest. <laughs> and Hazel's just like, shut up. Stop confessing to me. I am not a priest. <laughs> even the man that he killed is, like, convinced that this guy is a priest. Um... Yeah, he said he said he had only a few days ago believed in blasphemy as the way to salvation, but that you couldn't even believe in that because then you were believing in something to blaspheme. So that's that's where I found oh his belief has changed. Um, cause I guess I guess that really what's what that is about is Hayes is just trying to figure out his own new religion, and it's harder than he thought it would be to do that without contradicting himself. And these are things that people still struggle with. You know, people who haven't thought deeply about a lot of these issues, they're going around trying to figure it out on their own and kind of form a mishmash of their own religion. And that's exactly what Hayes is trying to do and finding it so difficult to do. Because he grew up in the South and had, uh, the, you know, he had faith drummed into him and couldn't forget it. Okay. Them that don't have a car don't need a license, the patrolman says, dusting his hands on his pants. So this is when, uh, so the Yale professor mentioned that police brutality is something that is shown in this book, which I thought was so interesting and true because um, they also hit Hazel over the head with a billy club, his new billy club, you know, that's what he was thinking of, my new billy club, I'm going to use it. And um, he actually, Hazel dies, you know, right after he gets hit in the head. In the police car, he dies, and the police don't even notice. Um, and in this instance as well, a policeman just shoves Hazel's stupid car off the side of a cliff. And it, and it is at this point that Hazel gives up and blinds himself. So he, he's planning to go out of town, and Hazel was planning to go out of town and preach his faith out of town. And he just realizes that's not going to happen anymore. He doesn't have a car, so he goes home and blinds himself. <laughs> And even when he's trying to get away from people, the landlady that he's with uh, just finds herself more and more attracted to him and eventually is like trying to marry him and it runs him out into the cold and he dies. <laughs> so that's how he ends up dying. Just wild. Okay, so... And I thought that the lady as well is um, the, the old la the landlady that he lives with at the end. You know, she just, whenever she thinks of eternal things, she just shoves them right out of her head because she's not religious, thank God, you know. <laughs> um, oh, she thanked the stars is what she said. Um, 
what possible reason could a sane person have for wanting to not enjoy himself anymore? And in Hazel's case, it's because he can't forget Jesus. Um, so, yeah, and it's just funny because by the end we see that she is irresistibly attracted to that as well. And, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. Oh, and his last, his last, is this his last words? One of his last words in this book is, I am not clean. I'm not clean, he says. So he finally figures it out. <laughs> so that is all my thoughts on Wise Blood. I know this was a very long video, but it was either long or not happening. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this and I hope that you'll join us on Noah's channel and I'll talk to you later. Let me know down below if you've read this and what you thought of it.